Good evening, I'm Rick Janser. Welcome to The Buck Stops here. Um, and because the buck for what's going on in this show, it really does stop with each one of us and what we're going to decide and what research we're going to do. Um, you guys know me as a former journalist. What I try to do is bring in many different aspects of a story so that you can decide, because I really still believe in my old former profession, um, in, the, in the journalistic ethics that you present all sides and you allow your audience to make their decision. It's not what Rick Dancer thinks. It's not what the doctor thinks. It's not what you know, you, it's what you think and what you decide. So we're going to give you some other information here, a different strategy tonight. And again, we want to thank our sponsor, Buck Sanitary Service, because uh, Scott, I sent him the, the uh, write up that I found on this gentleman you're going to meet. Uh, he read it. He says, yep, I think I'm good with that. Let's put it on there. And so we're going to have a conversation and I'll try to bring some of your comments in as well. Um, and we'll see if we can uh, get a little bit more information going on here. So here's our guest. All right. It's Dr. Jay Bhattacharya. Did I do it? Yeah, you did well. Okay. okay. And you are from Stanford. Um, you're kind of tell us about you and your team of people because you're you're mixing with people that are not of the same um, parties, uh, not of the same political bent. I'll just let you kind of take over from there. Uh, sure. So I uh, I'm a um, I'm a uh, professor of medicine at Stanford University. I've been writing for the last twenty years on infectious disease epidemiology and infectious disease policy. Uh, actually, I write on a whole bunch of things because I'm a health economist by training. I have an MD and a PhD in economics, both earned at Stanford. Uh, and as I said, I've been here as a, on the faculty for 20 some years. Uh, I've been working uh, recently on COVID uh, with two other professors, one at Harvard, Dr. Martin Kuldorf, who's a, pro pro uh, a professor of biostatistics and epidemiology, another epidemiologist, sort of world famous for designing uh, designing how to, how to track the safety of vaccines. Um, and then Dr. Sunetra Gupta at Oxford, probably the world's premier mathematical epidemiologist, uh, who's, and she's actually, she actually designed the, the way that we, we design the, the, the flu vaccine every year. So these are, these are folks who do infectious disease work for a living over uh, the world premier, sort of at the forefront of the world of, uh, uh, of, of designing vaccines and, and uh, tracking them. Uh, together, we've worked on this statement called the Great Barrington Declaration, which I hope we get to talk about today. So tell me, let's start with um, how deadly, so some facts about how deadly is COVID from what you guys have studied and what you guys have found. Sure. So um, the 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 COVID disease. When you when you think about COVID, you, we we immediately our, our mind goes to these dead, deadly viral pneumonias that we see on TV. The people people dying with with ventilators, uh, and that does happen. It is it is absolutely is a deadly disease. I mean, there's no question about that. Um, the the question is how frequent it is relative to how often people get infected. Well, the only way to answer that is by studies uh, that check to see. What what give, provide evidence that you have been infected? Um, you can't just look for the virus present now because once you've you, once you're cured of COVID, you, have, you don't you you know it's, the virus eventually goes away, right? It's like it's not like it stays around forever. You have to look for antibodies, um, and, and antibody studies from around the world now have been done, hundred of them, and what they found is that uh, uh, based on that, that COVID is actually much more common than you'd realize. COVID infection. A lot of the times, it's it's completely asymptomatic. Like you you get infected and nothing happens to you. Uh, a lot of the times, it does. It, there's some stuff happens to you, uh, like a, like a common cold. And a rare part of the time, you get this deadly viral pneumonia. So what do we know? Uh, let me just summarize it. Uh, if you're under 70, the more the survival rate from COVID infection is 99.95 percent. 99.95 percent. If you're over 70 the survival rate is 95%. 5% mortality is actually a really high rate. I mean, that's a, that's that's pretty severe. So for, for older people and for people with certain chronic conditions, it's really, really deadly. And for the rest of the population, it's much, much less deadly. So talk to me about the lockdowns. Um, you don't think this works at all. I mean, I think the lockdowns don't take advantage of the science around COVID. The, the, the key fact is we, we now know who's vulnerable. Um, for for the lockdowns, on the other hand, there are these they're essentially a a a hammer that ignores all these distinctions and in in doing so creates enormous harm. Uh, in some ways, actually, the lockdowns make COVID worse, right? So, for instance, um, the lockdowns ignore the fact that 
uh, let's say you're 64 and you have diabetes you're, and you're obese, and but you're a, a, a grocery store clerk. Well, the lockdowns don't protect you. You say you're 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 essential worker. They ask you to go go get exposed to the virus. Um, if you're if you're an uh, older person living in a uh, multi generational home, well, the lockdowns actually created multi generational homes. You're at high risk because your 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 twenty year three year old twenty four year old uh, uh, ch child lost their job because of the, the economic harm from the lockdown. They come back home and live with mom and dad, and now you have an intergenerational household that wouldn't exist before. Um, so it creates this enhanced risk of people who are older coming in contact with people who are younger and then causing sort of the spread of COVID to people who can least afford to get it. So the lockdowns, I think, are deadly in that sense. Uh, but also from other points of view, it's utterly deadly. So for instance, um, the lockdowns have led to people not getting needed medical care. Right, so we had uh, we we had less cancer screening, lower childhood vaccination rates, worse cardiovascular disease treatment, uh, de and deteriorating mental health. I mean, the toll is really high, and it'll keep going for years to come. Just take one thing, for instance, is a uh, uh, cancer screening. Like, so m women stopped getting mammography at an eighty percent drop in mammography rates over the during the lockdown, the the the, the, the severe lockdown in the spring, and then it's continued. So, so it hasn't recovered at the same rate. What we're going to see is many women with late stage breast cancer show up in next year that would have been caught early this year with early stage breast cancer that we're going to have a more breast cancer deaths as a consequence of the lockdowns uh, let me give one more statistic because it's it's absolutely heart-wrenching and everyone should know about this um, the cdc did a survey uh, as a study in june of this year that they found was that one in four young adults seriously considered suicide one in four Young adults seriously consider suicide since COVID this June because of the lockdowns, and these are people who are in, in effect when if they get COVID they have a very low mortality risk, and yet that you can th think about the mental anguish and the and the suffering that would lead to one in four seriously considering suicide. The lockdowns are a deadly tool and that should, should be used very carefully. Instead, we've used them in this sort of blunderbuss way that's that's uh, for almost, I mean, going on almost 10 months or 11 months uh, with causing immense mental and physical harm to the population. You said in the article that human beings are meant to be in c community together. Talk to people about that and why, because I think people are so um, fixated, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but they're so focused on stopping the deaths, stopping the deaths that I think sometimes we don't even look at the other kind of things that are dying. Um, it, it's like, well, those can be revived. Well, tell that to the business owner whose business is, is gone, you know, and how do you, and, and you know, here I mean, Doc, so kind of talk about that. I read that in your article. So yeah, I mean, we're, 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 meant, we're meant to be social, right? We're not, we're not meant to be alone. Uh, the whole purpose of the lockdown is to isolate each each other, and it has enormous costs. The me mental health consequences are absolutely devastating. As a concept, I mean, uh, just think in nursing homes. Nursing homes are a place where forty percent of the death has happened in the United States. Some, uh, and um, now we we absolutely should do a better job of protecting nursing homes, and we actually have uh, compared to the beginning of the year. But at the same time. You know, there's been a 20% increase in dementia-related deaths in nursing homes, isolation. Your, our, our moms and dads, our grandparents dying alone in nursing home settings um, because the, because the, the lockdowns prevent, uh, you know, even, even basic visits from grandkids or, or whatnot. We could do better. We could, for instance, have rapid testing that'll, uh, that would, that would allow you to, where the grandchild can get che checked and then they can go visit their, their grandma or grandpa or your parents can get, so you can go visit your parents. I mean, th we could do a lot better. Instead, we've just done these like blunderbuss lockdowns that don't account for the needs of humans, the physical and psychological needs of humans. You said in the article, the widespread lockdowns that have been adopted in response to COVID are unprecedented. Lockdowns have never before been tried as a method of disease control. Talk to me about that. Yeah, I mean, I think, uh, I mean, it's uh, it's disease. Uh, like, So what I mean by that is that the, the kind of lockdowns we've had, which is essentially this, uh, I mean, originally it was just like very, very severe quarantine orders, right? Like you just have to, you have to stay at home, shelter, at home, shelter in place. And now this like extended period of school closures, uh, business closures, uh, the, 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 the uh, I mean, here in California, they just closed playgrounds down. 
right? And in, in Los Angeles, they're saying you're not allowed to go walk outside. Um, I mean, I, th I think um, these kinds of measures in, in many ways are unprecedented, at least the last century of, of pu public health control. In other epidemics that we've managed in the last 100, uh, 100 years, we have had a much more um, uh, measured approach to this, uh, where we where we give people good information about what really is risky. We give them information about how to mitigate that risk, and we work to reassure the public at the same time trying to develop uh, vaccines and other things that, that 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 address it. I mean, I think we've done the, the, the that other side, the vaccine part, but what we haven't done, and we've, the mistake we've made, the big difference between earlier epidemics and this one is we've created panic in the population when normally good public health practice says, let's provide reassur reassurance rooted in science alongside with tools to, 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 to uh, for, for, so for people to like address the uh, address the address their own risk. So how did that panic start? Was that the, what most of us see as being fueled by the media? It was, it kind, it kind of became very quickly, more, more quickly than I've ever seen. And I've been in the news business for, you know, I was for 30 years. And you saw that all of a sudden there were no questions. Nobody can ask anything. It was, you, you, I think the message that really worked um, was that if you don't wear a mask or do this or do these things, you're killing other, you know, somebody else's grandma. Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I mean, there was, there was, there, there was, there was the, what, what you just described is a uh, sort of an action bias. Like, I'm going to give you something to do that will protect other people, which taps into our deep seated need to help others. I mean, that's, that's actually a good thing. I mean, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Right. But we can do that. We should, I mean, but you can do that without lockdowns. Um, th there's also this like incredible fear around, I mean, the original death numbers were on the order of three or 4% of people getting it die. That's not true. For the most of the population, for under seventy, as I said, the survival rate is ninety nine point nine five percent. So when it first came out, that's what we were hearing that it was going to be three percent or five, and it hasn't even come. I mean, it's like and, and you know the media image is all focused on the uncommon outcome, which is this deadly viral pneumonia, as as opposed to telling the population that look, um, it's bad. It can get bad. We should be careful, and here's what you can do to do it. But for, for most people, it's a mild cold. Or uh, or asymptomatic, no no symptoms whatsoever. I mean, I think um, the the rather than focusing on what's typical, we focused on what's the worst thing that could happen to you. Um, so 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 what do you do now? I mean, as not you, <laughs> but but what do we do in terms of the other? I'm gonna let me get off on a tangent real quick here first. The other thing that kind of bothers me about this, Jay, is that what we've also heard is so we lock down our gyms. We, we lock down our social life. We, um, I see now long lines at the fast food places that are still open where, so now you're feeding people food that's not keeping, we're not staying healthy. And, and then we're so, so we're trying to prevent COVID with a mask, which I'm not saying is bad, but I'm saying we're, we're trying to prevent COVID with all these things, but we're not doing the real hard work, which is getting healthy, get your body back together, get your, lose some weight. And instead we're, we're, they're, they're lining up at McDonald's 20 deep uh, to get a couple Big Macs because they can't get into any restaurants because they're all closed. Or, or also in food banks because like people are are, are, uh, are you know so poor that they now have to go get help for for uh, basic food 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 stuff. I mean, long lines for cars waiting to get handouts for food. Uh, the, I mean, I think I think um, the 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 lockdowns have created this this incredibly uh, a bit unequally distributed in a, in a way it's 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 devastated the poor. Actually, we've been talking about the United States. Can I just expand outside the United States? Uh, the UN this past uh, April estimated that the economic damage from the lockdowns worldwide were going to it, it create 130 million additional starving people, 80 million additional uh, child uh, children in poverty worldwide. Uh, enormous increases in tuberculosis and uh, 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 deaths from other infectious diseases that, that that we actually made a lot of progress on. Um, if you if you just calculate uh, the damage from the lockdowns, I think it's an order of magnitude worse in terms of the devastation and uh, and and harm it's caused worldwide to health compared to the, the whatever whatever uh, benefit we may have gotten from reductions in COVID. So what are some of your biggest concerns with the public and then the, the things you're trying to get out for people to hear? Because you, you're, we're hearing, you know, if, if, if anybody out, if anybody goes outside the, the narrative, then you're not handling the science. But you said that's not that, that, that uh, the narrative isn't a science. 
Yeah, I mean, I think that I, I, I'm like, what is science? What is the science? The science is, uh, I mean, I, I teach a, at a medical school. I teach students how to do science and how to think scientifically. Science is, in some sense, it's a conversation, right? So you and I disagree about some fact. Uh, well, we do an experiment to, and then we decide who was right and who was wrong. You you see that uh, the, the experiment comes out your way and I say, oh yeah, yeah, you're right, you're right, Rick, I was wrong. And then, but then we still have some disagreement and we go on to the next fact that we disagree on and then we, we do an experiment and check that. Science is a conversation that moves from one topic to the other that's resolved through this conversation. It's not, a, a, I know what's true and I'm gonna stop you from saying anything unless you, unless you agree with me. That's not science, that's something else altogether. Um, so I think that that that's been actually a big problem in our discussions around COVID. That we that there's been this sort of rather than a spirit of like doing science openly uh, and having these kind of conversations, there's a spirit of censorship uh, in science that's that's actually made things much worse, much more difficult to to uh, to to reason together the way science ought to work. One of the things that is that's frustrating, I think, too, is that like in our state in the beginning. Um, from what I know and I've uh, understand and research is, you know, it's basically the governor set up a medical team from the health departments. And I didn't hear anybody from the business community on that team um, or other players in culture uh, to have a, a plan, which it, to me, in my mind, and I, I'm just a guy, but I think you need a well-rounded group of people so you can say, how are we going to make a plan? Would that have kept us from doing what we did with this whole process? I think it might have. I mean, I think we we very early on decided that only people with a narrow set of experience would have any say whatsoever in what the right policy is, right? So people people with epidemiolo infectious disease epidemiology backgrounds and nothing else. You know what? I mean, I know a lot of infectious disease epidemiologists. They're, they're nice people, but they don't have uh, all the knowledge on earth to be able to say uh, this is the right thing to do. Let, let me put it another way. Uh, the science is one input into the right policy. The right policy needs to consider all of the all of the things that people value i mean for instance just just you know i want to prevent breast cancer from happening right i want to breast cancer mortality i want to prevent um people from starving to death in in in, in poor countries i want to i want to protect the the uh the person living uh, the, the, the 64 year old diabetic who's a, a, a store clerk from being infected i mean i think a, a broader view a, a broader set of disciplines at that table would have led to a very different conversation because we we basically decided against all evidence that the lockdowns were costless or whatever cost they were we're going to ignore them right they were just money or money costs we can get it all back but all that matters is lives and instead of doing the normal thing which is to consider both the costs and benefits of a policy before deciding to go down that line we decided you know it's just a costless policy we'll just do it there was almost no discussion whatsoever the cost just of the of the potential benefits of the lockdown so Karen Smith is asking, discuss RNA viruses and how small the particles are. Do the masks work? I mean, the, I mean, I, I, I think the masks work in some settings and, and, and not so well in other settings. It also depends. It's complicated. It depends on the, the nature of the, the material of the masks. Um, I think, for instance, N95 masks are much more effective than cloth masks. That there's a lot of good evidence on that. Uh, th there's no good randomized evidence establishing that masks protect protect you. That's that's true. I mean, there's no no good randomized. In fact, the there's one study that's been done, um, a randomized study that was done in in uh, in um, uh, the Netherlands, and they found that the, 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 basically a null effect with the, with a very wide standard error. Um, so, uh, it, uh, on the other hand, there are these physics studies that suggest that if you have symptoms and you sneeze into a mask, the particles go less far. So, I mean, it's, it's, it, the, I guess the, the, the evidence on masks is mi mixed. So, if yeah, if, you're in a, if you find out you're in a room and someone in there has COVID and you don't, um, having that mask on probably makes you feel a little bit better. <laughs> I mean, I think, I think it's just, it's, uh, the, well, again, it depends on the mask. Like in, in hospital settings, uh, with trained people using them, they work pretty well. I mean, they're, they're, there's, there's evidence that they work better. So it's just, I think uh, it's, it's, we shouldn't oversell the evidence. I mean, I'm not saying don't use masks, but we, we shouldn't pretend like they're, they're as good as a vaccine, for instance. There's no evidence for that. So Eric asks, mortality is not the only issue. What are your thoughts on the permanent damage from COVID, permanent health issues and cost? Uh, so uh, co COVID infection can yield non-respiratory consequences, right? So you can get uh, I mean, the cardiomyopathy was one. Um, you can get other coagulopathies. There are other consequences that have been documented from COVID infections. From all we can see so far, 
those consequences seem to be very rare. And uh, it's along the lines with other respiratory viruses. So for instance, the flu, the same thing happens. Uh, with the flu, you can get non-respiratory consequences. Of Sorry, I have my own train, doctor. I can, uh, <laughs> I'm pretty dang important in my own mind. <laughs> So just like with just like with with the flu, you can get non-respiratory consequences, but they're rare. Um, now with COVID, because it's a new disease, we don't know how. Uh, uh, we, we we actually the, the the literature on this is not been very good about how common it is. So there's still a lot of uncertainty around that, and which is which makes people nervous. Uh, I'll say like I I I I believe what the, where the literature is is headed is that it's it's very likely to be rare. Um, it's something we should take seriously and we should continue to research and it's worth thinking about. Um, but we shouldn't oversell it or nor should we tell the, tell people that it's common or likely when we don't know that if, know that's true. So masks do stop some droplets. Is that true? Yeah, that's true. They, okay, they somebody's droplets. asking that. So, you know, because in, in Oregon, it seems, and I think all over the country, there's this mask, anti-mask thing. And it's like, we almost just need to move past that. And to, to, to what, let's talk about the vaccine because you you are working with two people who are very involved in that whole process. Well, so let me let me let me circle back if you don't mind uh, Rick to you the can. you take it. Uh, so I cuz I want to I want to bring the vaccine back in in the context of it. So uh, it's it's a deadly disease for older people and much less deadly for non non older people and so uh, people without these chronic conditions. Um, the lockdowns are deadly all the way across. Let's put those two things together, right? So for the non-vulnerable, the people without the chronic conditions, the younger populations, the lockdowns are worse than COVID. So, uh, okay, say that again. So who, to, to be real clear on that. So people who are under 70, especially those with no chronic conditions, the lockdowns are worse than COVID. And children in particular, COVID is less deadly than the flu. More children this year have died of the flu than COVID in the United States. That's a fact. Um, on the other hand, the school closures and the lockdowns have been absolutely terrible for children. Uh, one estimate that was published in the Journal of American Medical Association Open Network found that it estimates that, that these school lock closures will lead to five and a half million life years lost for our children over their lifetimes because children who are less well educated lead poorer, uh, less healthy, shorter lives. Five and a half million life years stolen from our children because of the lockdown. The COVID is less deadly than the lockdowns for a very large chunk of the population. On the other hand, for the people who uh, who are vulnerable, people over 70, for instance, uh, COVID is is, 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 is is terrible. And yet we failed them. We haven't protected them where they live. We've 40% of the deaths are in nursing home settings. Um, we, we've done nothing for, for uh, older, workers uh, who, are, who have these like chronic conditions, we, we say you just go get exposed. I mean, although you could do something, you could you could use disability laws to protect them or, or whatnot. Um, so the, the plan is do focus protection of the vulnerable. That's the great pension plan. Focus protection, do overwhelming resources, testing, PPE, all, everything you can think of to protect the vulnerable where they live with, with tailored policies that take into account the living situations of the people where they live so that you can protect them with, with good policies there. At the same time, for the rest of the population for whom the lockdowns are actually harming them irreparably, lift the lockdowns, remove them altogether. Let people live close to normal lives. Now, people will still uh, protect themselves, PPE. I mean, I'm not against any of that. I think people will still want, uh, you know, if, if mass hand washing, uh, if, if you're sick, you should stay home. All those things are reasonable things that people will still continue to do and we should tell, recommend people do. But as far as like business closures, gym closures, school closures, uh, church closures, all of that, I, uh, I think is are on net harming much of the population and we should stop them. So I talked to an expert here locally and he said that, that um, what you what we should have done is gone into the nursing homes and the retirement centers and places like that and made them like hospitals because you're not seeing outbreaks in hospitals um, for the most part and the, treat it like that that kind of condition and we didn't do that and instead we got everybody in the program so you know because I think people want to make it like you're selfish because you're just putting these people at risk no lock down the people who need to be locked down who are the most vulnerable and then people on the other the rest of us should be living and keeping the economy going and keeping life moving and our and healthy and our kids in school and educating and making sure we don't have more poor people in our in our lives and our at our place 
Yeah, I mean, what, what, like one one very simple thing you can do uh, is like say you have an older person, uh, family living next next door to you, and you know that they have, they they're you know you know they're older and, and at risk, and that you they probably shouldn't be going grocery shopping. Um, you can go deliver groceries to them, like or or I mean, you can all, you know all kinds of things where you can you can help. Um, so I think uh, that that's that's the that's the basic kind of uh, idea of the policy. Uh, you know, one one set of, like the pushback we got on this this Great Barrington Declaration plan has been that well, is it possible to protect the vulnerable? But you know what? You, it, it is now that we have the vaccine, which is going to come out. I mean, I just saw the safety data. It looks, uh, the, the, I just saw the uh, the efficacy data. It looks really really good. Um, we can use the vaccine to protect the vulnerable. Uh, the CDC has actually prioritized older older people for the vaccine, which is exactly the right thing to do. Um, and once uh, and and, we, and with the, with the, this uh, uh, this Operation Warp Speed, we're going to have enough doses within the next two months to to basically cover everyone who's vulnerable that wants it. Um, and so so at that point, what argument is there for the lockdown? There just isn't one, right? Because the the the, the vulnerable are protected, and for the rest, the lockdowns are worse than COVID. So even if you're asymptomatic, somebody's asking, problem is you don't know if you're healthy or not. Yeah, so that's that's the argument for uh, for for uh, uh, not exposing vulnerable people to the to. So, for instance, the lock I, I, I've kept coming back to this, the, the, the clerk who's has, uh, you know, has these uh, these has has these chronic conditions is 64 years old, is vulnerable if they should get infected, the, the they're they're sitting all day long interacting with people some of whom may be asymptomatic and being exposed to the vaccine the, to, to the virus the lockdowns don't protect them right that's that's the problem we should be the focus protection idea is to think of how to protect the people if they get the virus they will have a very high mortality risk um so the, the it's true the asymptom now the thing about the asymptomatics one thing is important to know is that it, it they spread the disease less efficiently than someone who has symptoms Right, so if you uh, so if you're sneezing and coughing, you're you're gonna you have more viral out, output just naturally um, than someone who's asymptomatic. It's not that asymptomatic people can't spread the disease at all; they can. It's just they're much much less. You have to be in the same room with them for a very long time, whereas someone who has the symptoms, you, you they're gonna spread it to you much more efficiently. There was recently a study done in, in Wuhan, of all places, in uh, in June or July this year. Ten million people, uh, uh, three hundred people found they contact all of whom were asymptomatic. 10 million people tested, 300 people positive, all asymptomatic. They tested all of their contacts and they spread it to none of them. Uh, oh. So it's interesting. The asymptomatic spread does happen. I, I mean, there are documented cases of that, but it's much less efficient than symptomatic spread. But wasn't that what, what, they, what they used to do the lockdown? Is because you, since you don't know you had it, you could be killing people that you don't even know that you're killing. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the lockdown, really, the, the purpose of the lockdown is to reduce the number of human interactions. That's the main purpose. That's the only purpose of it is to reduce so that, uh, that you know, every human interaction can in, in involve me, if I'm positive, spreading the virus to you. So the idea of the lockdown is stop doing, stop having human interactions. If they could, they would have just said, everyone sit alone in your room for the next two months and then 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 come out. Of course, that's not humanly feasible. Um, so I think the, the 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 problem is that is that it, you think about the lockdowns as an effective tool because you think of like lab rats separated from one another, locked in cages. That is not how human societies work, right? As we talked about, the lockdowns have had all these effects. The theory of the lockdowns is way 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 worse than the actual practice. So what about lowering the curve um, and and medical workers? Because I get sometimes people write me and going, "I'm in the hospital. I'm seeing this," you know, and and that kind of thing. Yeah, they are. I mean, there are there are hospitals are busy. Um, they have been busy um, uh, recently. Actually, it's funny. In the spring, we shut down hospitals. Uh, uh, we closed down. Uh, we did these lockdowns, and the hospitals in much of the country went empty. Yeah, right? they, they furloughed their workers because they actually went bankrupt. A large part of the CARES Act funds went to bankrupt hospital systems. Um, so, I mean, it's it's. Uh, uh, I think this time of year, generally hospitals are usually busy. This is the respiratory disease center, uh, respiratory you know uh, uh, disease uh, uh, season. Um, so I think that you, you're seeing busy hospitals now. Are we seeing overwhelmed hospitals? Well, what does overwhelm mean? That means you're a patient who can't. There's no bed for you at their local hospital. There's no place you can go be transferred to, and as a result, the care you get is is substandard. 
I haven't seen a ton of evidence of that. I'm not saying it's not possible, but I haven't seen a ton of evidence of that. Uh, how do you deal with that? It's not, again, it's not lockdowns. You build spare capacity, field hospitals and, and other mechanisms so that you, you, uh, uh, you, you, you can provide care uh, some overflow capacity as opposed to like bl blunderbuss lockdowns, which actually don't, I mean, you know, actually what lockdowns do is they just move cases into the future a, a little bit. Uh, apparently that, which is, I mean, they don't get rid of the disease. They're not, they're not aimed at that. Um, can they be used to, to, to protect hospital systems? I mean, I suppose it's possible, but they're a really poor way to do it. So David asked, quarantine the sick and not the healthy, but what about the notion of weaponized guilt? That's asymptomatic people spread to COVID. Well, I'll be fine, but you could be blaming for killing mentally thoughts. I think we, I think we just answered that, didn't we? Oh no, can I, actually, they, that's a really good question because it brings okay. up another public health principle that we violated in this, in this, uh, in our, in our, our um, uh, in our uh, uh, lockdown policy. We should never shame people who have the disease and we shouldn't make people guilty for passing the disease on. We, I thought we'd learned our lesson with AIDS and HIV, right? Oh, that's a great point. I mean, public health, it's created this like very strange situation where like uh, you're, you're 19 years old and you go outside and do 19 year old things and now all of a sudden you feel guilty you're, you're made to feel guilty because you're doing normal things. It, it doesn't, it's not actually good public health practice. And if someone gets COVID, God forbid, you're, you're to blame. You, you, you failed. You, you didn't wear the mask or using, but you know, people get COVID. They don't even know what they did. Like you see these people and they say, oh, I've been, I've been protecting myself. I don't know how I got COVID. We, public health should not create a situation where we're shaming um, people for passing the disease on and should not create a situation where we're shaming the person who gets this. And it's a huge failure of public health, I think. If you've had COVID, are you immune? Do we know that yet? Do we have any yeah. idea? The answer is yes. We know that. Really? We, yeah, we know that very well. So at this point, um, there's there's two kinds of, of very very simplest like to simplify things. There's two kinds of immune responses. One is these antibody responses. Um, when you get COVID infection, the vast vast 99.99. I mean, the very large fra fraction of people actually uh, produce antibodies. We know that for a fact. The antibodies are protective, so you don't get reinfected while you have them. Um, and now those decline over time, over, over the course of a few months. But at the same time, you're also producing the cellular immunity, these T cells, which last much longer. Um, we shouldn't be surprised by this. The other coronaviruses, which are like common cold viruses, produce immunity that last you know, one, two, three, four years. I mean, there, it's, it's not, and when you get reinfected, you have a much milder version of the cold that you originally had. Uh, that's going to be true for mo the vast majority of people who got COVID already. Is this not SARS two? Uh, this is our. This is that's the SARS CoV two virus. That's exactly what this is. The COVID nineteen is the disease. SARS CoV two is the virus that produces the disease. So, so what do we do now, Doc? Um, you know, you guys have done this study, and I want you to kind of explain. The three doctors that, that you guys are, you're dealing with, and then you have all these other doctors signing on. This is not a liberal thing. It's not a it's not a Republican thing. It's not a Democrat thing. It's not a. I mean, you guys are from all different. Yeah, this is not that, politics. No. This to, to me, this is not politics. This is what is good public health. Um, I mean, my the, the other docs who I've signed on at this point, actually, there's the two docs I talked about in the beginning of the show. There, I think they're to the left of me. I honestly don't know because I don't really. We don't talk about politics. We talk about science. Um, uh, we uh, we uh, the, the 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 folks who signed on. Uh, there's now almost thirteen thousand epidemiologists and other scientists that have signed on to this plan. Uh, forty thousand, almost forty thousand, thirty five thousand, forty thousand doctors who have signed on to this plan, and, and uh, seven hundred thousand members of the general public have signed on, including people from all walks of life, including uh, you know uh, economists, uh, you you name it. People have signed on. Um, you can go sign on to, at that at, 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 at great. At, you know, if you Google Great Barrington Declaration, you can find it. So what is the what does this document do? If people are signing up, what are they saying? Just basically, we agree with you. Yeah, they're just you're just support just registering support for it. I mean, I think um, uh, the 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 narrative has been that there's only one right way to deal with this epidemic, and hopefully uh, the listeners can understand there is not that's not actually true. There are other ways that are better to deal with the epidemic than one being, than the one we've been following. And um, once you know what those the, the facts are, I mean, these are like basic epidemiologic facts. I'm not saying anything that's actually controversial. I'm just following the reasoning from from these facts to what the right policy should be, right? Um, uh, so I think, you know. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, I think, I mean, I think so basically you're, you're uh, 
by signing, you're just you're you're letting people know that look, there are people who don't uh, who 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 that that th it's not the only way to deal with this isn't these lockdowns. It isn't the 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 the, the, the failed policy that we've been we've having. There are alternate policies that are reasonable that are much more likely to work, protect lives, reduce lie uh, harm from COVID, and reduce harm from non-COVID sources. So, are there a lot of doctors? Are you finding that they're afraid? Uh, to come out and do what you're doing. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, the the, the um, one of the reasons why we wrote this and why we invited people to sign on is to is to address this censorship that we talked about earlier, right? Uh, we wanted to give people uh, who don't have our the credentials we have, but that can see just like we can see, because this is not a complicated question. It's just it's a it's a question of seeing what the facts are and following it. Um, that but give them permission to say, look. I'm seeing this thing. I'm seeing what the right policy is. Let me say it out loud, because uh, otherwise, what we end up with is a situation where people see a, a restriction, like you know, a, a, let's close down, uh, uh, let's close down a, a, a playground, and they say it doesn't make any logical sense, but they're afraid to say anything because, oh, well, what if someone smart said something that knows better than me? Well, closing playground, there's no science behind it, right? So by by saying these things out loud, we can then point to the evidence and then people can make up their own minds and then open up the room for discussion so we can actually have a, a reasoned discussion over this as opposed to this sort of uh, you know, crazy censorious si uh, silencing that we've sort of faced through this whole epidemic. Yeah, I've got people today that are on other Facebook pages that are uh, going in and putting fake news on all my pages. And they're also uh, going onto Yelp uh, for a, a woman who stayed open and they're and they're trashing her well Yelp reviews. So we're using techniques that are that are just bullshit um, to attack people for just having a freaking conversation. What ha I mean, what happened? You know what I mean? When yeah. I mean, I have never seen anything. My wife and I bang our heads on this wall. We got I've never seen anything like this where we can't even discuss what if there's another option to find better things? That's so arrogant because it's like, I only am the only one who knows the answer. So nobody else can do this. And I think that's why, uh, Jay, what you wrote is so refreshing to people. And you guys, I was going to post it. Is it written? Is this on the site? Uh, the Great Prevention Declaration site has the, not not the this article that, uh, that, that I think you have, which is the imprimis article, but the Great Prevention Declaration has uh, a lot of material. So it has both the declaration itself, which is which I've just talked about, but also has a, a frequently asked questions page. So you can see a lot of the, many of the questions that have been asked here, great questions actually are addressed on this on the FAQ. Um, and you can see where people have signed on. It's an international thing. I only um, have really smart friends, just so you know, Ray. <laughs> okay, Jay. I, um, I, 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 here's the thing. I could post this, but I'm so afraid to do so that it because words get pulled faster on social media than anything else. And I've been afraid to post it. I've just been sending it privately to people because I'm afraid uh, to to do that. That's what used um, to happen. This old, old Soviet Union. There were called, it was called Samistat. You would you'd pass you'd, 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 someone would write something interesting, and they would rather than like trying to publish it, they would slowly pass it around secretly to one another so that everyone could see what the what the truth was. Um, which is kind of a strange position for an American to be in. What do you, what do you hope? I, I think we can be done with the epidemic in a, in, a, in in a month and a half or two months. So, like the, the the pushback we got on the declaration is that we can't protect the vulnerable, but with the vaccine we can. Um, we'll have enough doses to protect the to, to inoculate uh, every older person who wants it and other other vulnerable people within two months. And uh, at that point, I think I hope that the lockdown is lifted and we never use lockdown again as a as a tool for public for infection control because I think it was an enormous public health mistake. Um, Doc, you have um, tons of people have come on and said, um, I, I want to read Eric's because I thought that was Eric. What is, where is your comment? I thought that was really, really, really good. Um, oh, hold on. I got to find it. Where are you, Derek? Oh, here we go. This describes what happened. I think my blood pressure is dropping. Thank you. I'm glad I can improve somebody's health. <laughs> I, yeah, well, that's, you're in public health. You should, right? That's kind of your job. You're trying to make up for the what, what's happened on on the on the side here. Well, I'm ashamed to call myself a, a, a scientist at this point. Why? I mean, I think what we've done is, is an enormous mistake. I think we've ended up harming a very large number of people uh, that didn't need to be harmed if we just been more 
thoughtful about the right policies. We shouldn't have created panic. We shouldn't have created shame. We should have paid attention to what the science of who's vulnerable and then uh, arranged our policy to protect them. A shame on us. Yeah. I mean, especially children. I think um, uh, the harm we've done to our children in this country, you know, schools around the world are open. Uh, it's, it's just the United States that's, that's closed our schools. Well, schools in Montana are open. I was just there. Schools in Idaho are open. Schools in South Dakota are open. California. Um, yeah. So, gosh, Doc, this is probably one of the most inspiring things I've gotten to do in a long time. And it's just, I think it's, I, I appreciate your having the guts to, to write the article and to work with this group. Um, for all of you guys who are on here, who are asking me for the article, I will email it to you if you email me at rick at rickdancer.com. And then I will send you an email of it that I have. I have it set up, but I just can't, I, I, this is where I do business and I can't lose my, my uh, platform or you guys are all going to have to start paying my monthly bills. <laughs> you can also go to the gbdeclaration.org site and they can see uh, the basics of what, I, what I've said. Okay, they have it. Um, they have been posting it on here. So people have that and have seen it. So, um, uh, so yeah, I, I will let you go. Now, now, now tell me, are you going to be on KPNW here in town too? I got an invitation. I've gotten I've gotten lots of invitations from. So I'll I'll definitely think about it. Okay, you should if you would. He, he's a really good guy, and he's like a, a friend of mine. And I went. He's, he right. read the article. I said, "Hey, this is what I'm doing. You should put this on your radio show." And he goes, "Rick, where did you get this?" <laughs> Go ahead, say what. If you say so, I'll definitely do it, Rick. I just okay. I've been, I've been, I've been I'm, you know you can probably tell I'm not used to media. I'm, I'm usually I'm usually a, uh, I, I sit and write articles for a living. I mean, I so, you know I just it's kind of. A, uh, scientific articles for a living. So it's, it's kind of a strange thing to be wanted on media. Oh no, you were great. I mean, you, I think you are like really good at this. You should be, um, you should be doing this more often and get that message out. So, um, thank you. Okay. I really appreciate your time. Thank you. This is All right. Great All right. See you later, Jay. Thank you. All right. There you go, guys. Um, wow. That gives you something to think about, huh? So one of the things I think that he said that I really want to reiterate is don't, we shouldn't be shaming people or each other. So that goes for you too. If you believe what he just said, and this lines up with more what you're thinking, um, don't turn around and go shaming people who believe the opposite or believe something different. That is not going to do anything to change this. Um, we can't use the same tactics that other people are using. We have to go in kindness. And I'm going to preach it because I've said this to you before. We are a community and community is an action word. That means we have to participate. Um, we are to love our neighbor and that love is an action word. That means we have to participate and do something um, and whatever that is for you. But we don't have to be angry and mean even when people are angry and mean to us because what we want, I can tell you as a communicator, people never listen when you shout and yell and shame and throw things at them. We listen from conversation and relationship. And that's what the lockdown has robbed us of. And we have to get that back is our relationship with people and mending the fences, because that's the thing nobody ever talks about is the shame behind the mask and the eyes and looking at people and suspecting and somebody calling on Trudy because she opened her restaurant early and calling the government people like that. God, you guys, this isn't Germany in the 1940s. We live in the United States of America and we need to treat each other better than that. So there, I'll climb off my soapbox. Did you guys know? Oh. I truly have a soapbox. Rick Dancer TV. Look at dovetailed. A cabinet maker in Harrisburg made that for me. So I have a soapbox that I can climb on and I can climb off. So I'm off my soapbox. Share this on your page because Facebook is not letting me share things right now because I violated their community standards, which I don't know what those are, but apparently I'm a bad man. So if you would share this on the pages, I will put this on Instagram and I will post that. If you send me rick at rickdancer.com, I will send you Jay's article um, in its entirety and you will be able to see it. So 
Thank you very much, you guys. Jay, thanks again. I know you can still hear me. Um, and that's it. Oh, and thank you, Buck Sanitary Service, for sponsoring the show, for putting stuff out like this so we can do this. And you guys, I know if you have to go to the bathroom, you're not going to wait for a Buck Sanitary Service potty. But if you're having a party or you work for a city or a government, encourage them to sponsor the people who sponsor me because I can't do this content without people like Scott and Lisa Weld at Buck Sanitary Service. All right. Have a good night. Um, that was a good show. <laughs> if I may 